I did this talk at the uh, American uh, Arthroscopy Association of North America meeting on behalf of my tech. So, you know, a lot of questions I get asked are like, why I use quad and, and how it pertains to graph selection. And Chris gave me a whopping five minutes when probably we could spend five days on graph selection. Um, I think it brings several advantages to the table. It's all the data we have demonstrates that it's been comparably effective as an autograft compared to a lot of the other ones like BTB autograph and hamstring autograft. Um, so with this, it just provides the surgeon with another autograft option uh, for both primary and probably even more critically for revision scenarios. In my practice, I've gone towards this more in a way from hamstring more because I use it as an all soft tissue option. Um, but as opposed to harvesting the hamstring tendons where the patient's anatomy dictates the size of the graft, with the quad tendon, you get to pick your own size and harvest it any way you want to exactly like you would a, a bone patellar tendon bone. So um, I use all soft tissue. You can add in a bone block. And with all of this variability and predictable sizing, you can pretty much use it on any patient from any population with any fixation technique uh, that you should choose, whether it's suspensory rigid loop fixation or, or milagro fixation. And then as you'll kind of see with this harvest technique, there's no fancy equipment. It literally involves a scalpel, a pair of scissors, and a couple of retractors, and that's about it. And so there's nothing, there's no added expense um, with disposable equipment. There's there's no fancy stuff that you got to keep on the shelf. It's all it's all readily available. Um, so where am I using it currently? I'm um, using it as an option for revision ACL surgery. Uh, like for example, if somebody's had a bone patellar tendon bone before, and and we still want to stick with uh, something of, of similar strength and functionality, it works really well. Um, I use it for the under 40 recreational athlete that wants an autograft. Um, my, you know, my caveat to all this is I still think for the young, high level athlete, whether it's high school, collegiate or professional, I still think patellar tendon is probably the gold standard, but perhaps for the uh, rec more recreational type um, in that age category or the uh, recreational type above 25 or the recre recreational teenage athlete, I think the quad is a really good option. I've started using it more as the hamstring alternative for females specifically, and even ones that don't uh, want a BTB but might fit that criteria. Uh, and I use this, it's a little bit kind of level five evidence subjective reasoning, but females are more naturally in a little bit of valgus uh, and they are more naturally quad dominant and hamstring deficient. So if I start harvesting a hamstring, am I adding to the imbalance of their muscle balance? And am I unloading a potential medial stabilizing structure when they're already in valgus? So I think the quad brings a good alternative to that. Um, here in Utah and in Colorado, we see a lot of 40, 50 plus year old athletes that are still like skiing moguls and backcountry skiing. And so these really avid quote, older athletes that don't want an allograft and um, want to stay kind of in their game. And then, as I mentioned before, the adolescent, uh, again, hamstring is very patient size dependent. If they have open growth plates and they can't tolerate a bone patellar tendon bone, then the quad is a perfect autograft alternative. Do you ever augment these repairs with uh, ALL or, or any other, you know, uh, tangential or uh, peripheral um stabilizers or, or techniques to, um, you know, to, to supplement the uh, graph selection, particular graph selection? Yeah, good question. So um, I, I have not with uh, quad specifically because I'm still reserving like uh, BTB for my primary graph for like the young high level athlete. Now that even that's not evidence-based um, so to kind of go down the hole a little bit for those that aren't familiar, there's a study uh, by Al Getgood, who's from Canada, who looked at hamstring tendon autograft with and without LET. And there's been other studies that have compared it, but that's probably the most high level, largest cohort direct comparison group. And they found that um, the hamstring 
with LET as compared to hamstring alone in patients under the age of 25 cut the failure rate in half. And so it's kind of, uh, it's called the, um, oh gosh, it, it's got a, a, a trial name to it, but, and I can't think of it, but they're doing a trial, a trial two, which is quad and BTB to determine if it has the same efficacy, which hopefully we should have some results on in the next couple of years. Now I don't use hamstring in that population. And then that's the population where I am using LET as an augment, even in the primary ACL reconstruction, but I've been using BTB. I haven't done enough quad revision surgeries uh, for ACL, but that would be one scenario where if I was doing a revision, everything else looked right, and I was going to use a quad, I'd add in an LET pretty readily. Yeah. And really, as I alluded to, the flexibility of the of the graft, whether they like, if they like a bone plug, well, you can take a bone plug, you can fix it with an interference screw. If they like a, an all soft tissue graft, you can do that. You can do all inside with suspensory fixation. You can do suspensory on the femur and a screw on the tibia. It truly is probably the most dynamic graft we have. And again, all the, you know, all of the outcomes and failures and everything we have is, is comparable to, to everything we've been using for 20 years. I rehab every graft the exact same way. I don't do anything different. Um, so it, for whatever, whatever protocol you would be using for any of the other ones. And for me, the, I, I let them weight bear as tolerated immediately. I have them wear like a hinged range of motion brace for the first six weeks. But if it's an isolated ACL, they um, weight bear is tolerated immediately and range of motion is tolerated immediately. And I've uh, been doing that the same way for almost uh, six plus years and I, I haven't had any problem. Usually people, people will self-limit how fast they're going to, enter into that stuff. But even um, when I was in Colorado, we were having some people start that protocol the same day as surgery. So um, I get pretty aggressive right out the gate with, with their mobilizing them. Um, there has been some concerns with the quad about uh, an increased development of arthrofibrosis as compared to some of the other graphs. And, you know, rehab could call into question, be called into question with regards to that. I have not had that problem. And I speculate that the people that are having that problem are probably taking too big of a graft and overstuffing the graft in the knee. And it's causing impingement, whether it's on the PCL or on the femur. And uh, because they're so used to like taking a size nine or a 10 graft or something with the BTB and with hamstrings, but with a quad, it's a really meaty piece of tissue. And so I always try to shoot for harvesting like a nine or so. Uh, and, and by the time you kind of get it all dialed in, it ends up being an eight and a half to a nine. And it seems to be very reasonable. I haven't had that problem, but I haven't, I think also initiating that early mobility prevents the arthrofibrosis. Inhibition or even like a lack of extension. Um, I have not had that experience, uh, knock on wood. Um, you know, the hard part about all of this is that all ACLs get some sort of, you know, muscle inhibition. Um, and so, you know, I, we have not directly studied that quantitatively that you actually have read our minds though. We're actually working on setting up kind of a study here where we're going to follow it with MRI and with um, strength testing and physical therapy. And then also with like subjective patient outcomes and see, you know, number one does, uh, does it objectively matter? Number two, does, is it subjectively reflected? And number three, can we actually quantify it on an MRI? So give, it, give us about two years and hopefully we'll have you that answer. But I don't know the answer right now, but I haven't, I haven't seen it subjectively. One of the beauties of it is the simplicity. So this is literally the entire back table to do an entire isolated ACL. There's like, I don't know, like 20 pieces of equipment here and maybe even some of them aren't needed. So um, you know, the cruciate plus guides, um, the twister, um, a guide pin and a graph board, and then you got your implants back there and that's pretty much it. Um, so, uh, the speed trap is optional. Um, you know, it can be a little bit more efficient, but really that's it. The reason is I like the rigidity of the guides as compared to some of the competitors. So, the, the way that the guides ratchet into place and they're very um, stout, like the actual 
guide itself is all one piece as opposed to two pieces, and then everything else can lock and ratchet in place. Um, it allows for efficiency during the surgery in that you can put the guide on the knee and um, you don't have to have someone actually holding the guide while you drill. And this, this became really apparent for me when I was a surgeon in the army and when I would be in the uh, uh, operating room, it would simply just be me and one single scrub tech and that was it. And so, and our scrub techs weren't very proficient at using the camera. So I would, I would basically position the guide, ratchet and lock it into place and then let go of the guide. And then I'd be holding the camera in one hand and the drill in the other. And I'd basically be soloing the, the, the tunnel drilling for the ACL because it was just me and this other person that didn't know how to do arthroscopy. So that kind of revolutionized how I approached it. And um, with, with, with other guides just was not feasible. And so now um, literally, like if I had nothing else, um, I, would, I would ask for the guide and I could figure out the rest of the surgery. <laughs> So um, for me, yeah, the cruciate plus is, is, is money. It's absolutely money. I, I teach residents uh, here that are, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know how your training programs work there, but we basically have first through fifth year residents and we have fellows who are, are specializing in sports medicine from orthopedic surgery. And, and when you have somebody that's learning, making sure that you have equipment that is really simple and kind of foolproof makes them learn the procedure better. So for me now, as an educator as well, I think they are really critical in my armamentarium as in, in getting the teaching done without compromising the surgery. Are you, if you're doing a full tibial tunnel, are you using the Crucial Plus instruments for that? And if so, how are you doing the, uh, the full tibial tunnel? Yeah, so I just used that, um, the pointed tibial ACL guide. I don't know if you can see my marker right here. And, um, you know, with this ratchet on there, and then I use the um, 2.4 millimeter sleeve. And so I drill up the 2.4 millimeter pin into my uh, footprint. <clears throat> and I will then take the guide off. I clamp the pin with a coker clamp. And then I just take whatever size barrel reamer I want and uh, finish off the tunnel. It's pretty simple. I don't use the cruciate plus unless I'm doing like an all inside or a suspensory fixation. But I just, yeah, ju I use the guide still to get my mark. Um, again, cause I like the rigidity. Some of the, some of the other guides, you know, if you, they're, if they're flexible in any way, shape or form, the guide pin will diverge and it'll miss its mark. And so with this one, it's like, and it's like a 99.99% hit rate. You know, it's, it's really reliable. So I basically position the knee at 90 and I use a vertical incision here and there's a little piece of fat that's over the tendon. So I uh, remove that piece of fat and literally right below there is the quad tendon. And the video on the far right is I take a Cobb elevator and in line with the tendon, I just elevate the rest of the stuff proximally. This dotted line that's right here is the outline of the VMO muscle. So I'm constantly keeping that in mind because I don't want to damage any muscle. Uh, but it's a pretty cosmetic incision. This is actually probably twice the size of what I use now. Uh, once you get this all elevated, it's really easy to see up underneath there. So again, kind of another uh, position here. Once I got that elevated off, I actually stick the scope camera up the quad tendon and I visualize the trajectory of it, as well as keep in mind where the muscle lies and where the, where the muscle meets tendon. So this will give me a good idea. As you can see on the far right, I mark where the, the light tends the skin. Gives me a good idea of the extent of the quad tendon so I can use a small kind of cosmetically friendly incision. What this video doesn't show, and I can't remember if the next slide does, is once you got the camera in there, you can actually kind of pinch the camera at the level of the incision and pull it out. And you can also get an idea of how long your graft is gonna be. And you need at least 65 millimeters of graft to make this work. And I'll go into a little bit later why that is. But um, so I'm just checking length, I'm checking trajectory so I can again do this in a cosmetically friendly fashion. 
So here's kind of looking from the top down. The picture on the left, I've made two marks nine millimeters apart, and that's right at the superior pole of the patella. And I basically just use a knife and I elevate off a little, a little nubbin of tendon. And once I have a nubbin free, I, uh, as you see on the right here, I've, I've whip stitched just the end of it so I can kind of get control of the tissue. And after that, it's kind of game over. So I got my width dialed in. I'm simply using a pair of Mayo scissors and I'm going up each medial and lateral side and as well as up the, the deep side of it. And I'm just releasing it up through the wound. Um, I kind of tend to do it in a cylindrical fashion. Again, trying to keep the graft from being overly bulky. Um, you can do it full thickness through the whole tendon or you can do partial thickness. It really doesn't matter. I, I kind of tend to go near full thickness. I try not to violate the joint at all. Um, but still very simple tools, a pair of scissors and a stitch. So next, this is a kind of a, a dealer's choice. Um, once the tendon is delivered, you can prep it with either like a speed trap, which is really quick and efficient, or you can just whip stitch it with more ortho cord or like there's the new looped uh, Dyna loop or perma loop stitch that'll be coming out. Um, and you just really need a good locking stitch in the, uh, in the end of that tendon. And this is gonna be important number for, for adding the rigid loop implant, but also for delivering the graft. So I'll tell you, after having done more and more in these, getting the speed trap on while it's still in the knee is a little bit harder than in the cadaver, which this demonstration was. So I've gone more to just um, either doing it on the back table or just doing the Krakow stitch as seen on the right and, and locking the stitches in place while it's still in the patient. Um, the other thing you'll notice is if you're gonna use the speed trap, I use it a little unconventionally. So you can see that the graft is not sticking out of the speed trap, it's actually within the speed trap. So what that does is it grabs the tissue like it normally should, but it also pinches the end of the graft so that it, it kind of bulletizes the end so that there's not this big, like hunky piece of tissue that's gonna get bunched up when trying to put it in your, in your tunnel. So it kind of makes it more aerodynamic. So then we, once we get more control, it's just continued release. Uh, the assistants are kind of pulling up on the retractors just, and I'm just looking from the end of the bed, I'm looking straight up the incision up the quadriceps and, and keeping an eye on my trajectory, making sure I don't violate muscle, making sure I don't violate the joint. If I'm still uncertain, I, I st can stick the camera back in there and really confirm where the end of it is. And then what you'll also see on that video on the right is once I've gotten the length that I need, I'm just making a little percutaneous incision at the level of the end of the graft and releasing it uh, uh, underneath the skin. Again, no, not violating any muscle, no special equipment. We're still just at scissors and a knife here. And here's some other demonstrations of that. So I've kind of got the graft completely released. I'm ready to get it out of the knee. And, um, and you can use the camera, but really honestly with the Army Navy and looking down the, the incision, most of the time it's just pure visualization with my own eyes. I don't need the camera and it should release out of the wound. What was the learning curve, do you think, on, on doing this um, you know, graft harvest technique? Purely, um, you know, what yeah. we see in the Australian market, obviously there's a, specific arthrex quad tendon harvester which is probably the, the most commonly one used that we see but i guess you know yeah you know how did you go about sort of um going down this road of, of this graft harvest technique yeah so the actually the where i learned quad acl from was a guy that was an arthrex guy but he he would do this manual uh release with the scissor but then rather than making the little stab incision, he would use the quad pro harvester to just, or the cigar cutter to just release it. So he wouldn't make that little stab incision. But I was like, man, you are like opening this several hundred dollar disposable device to simply do like make this one little cut. And it seemed silly to me. And um, so everything else, I, I have to give credit to someone else. It was just making that little perk incision that was like light bulb, like, holy cow. This is so easy and you don't need anything special. And so, you know, it, I, I really can't emphasize enough how simple it is. And 
I did go in and, and do it in the lab one time before trying it on a patient. Um, but literally, um, the visualization is so much better than even these, these uh, videos allude to. And, um, and it's, it's really straightforward. When I was learning how to do just quad tendon in general, I watched, I watched my director do it one time. He watched me do it one time. And from there on out, he was like, okay, from now on, it's up to you. I'm not even going to watch anymore. It like literally took two reps to figure out how to harvest a quad. And then one rep in the lab to learn that the, the, uh, the 11 blade through the skin up there is effective. Um, on the first patient I did it on, because it's always two people want good cosmesis, right? Like they want to, they want sexy and, and, and uh, functional. So the first guy I did it on, I was a little wondering how they were going to respond to that incision way up top. And when they had come back for their first post-op at like two weeks, I, I actually couldn't find it. Like I couldn't see the incision because it had already healed so well and so completely with it. It's literally like a half a centimeter, you know? So um, it's really, it really is a quick learning curve. I do all soft tissue quad. And to be, to be honest, uh, whether I do all inside or whether I completely drill out the tibia depends upon the level of trainee that I have with me. <laughs> so for our, um, for our fellows who are taking up a career of sports medicine, I try to teach them the all inside because, because not everybody here does that. And so I think it's a good, uh, technique to teach them. Plus they're technically savvy enough to do it. Um, if I have like a more junior level trainee and we're just trying to learn the basics of ACL surgery, then I completely drill out the tibia. It's just one less kind of futzy step that could potentially go, go sideways and where there's, they should be just learning the basics. So, um, you know, and, and not to kind of backtrack, but to your point, if this, this, the rigid loop, not all inside, but the rigid loop and everything, you don't need a twister to do this either, right? You can, you can kind of AM portal drill your, your uh, femur and drill out your tibia and you can still use this graph and use this stuff and use, so, you know, it might even be, if you have a surgeon or somebody that, that is very traditional like that, and you're trying to inch them away, you, it, that could be, again, part of your selling point where, you know, this graft is so dynamic, you can use any kind of fixation, any kind of drilling, and you can find a way to make it work with the MyTech portfolio. So, and then, you know, maybe eventually they do get into the rigid loop and stuff like that. So it's really such a dynamic uh, procedure that can open up other avenues for you from, from your side of things. So 65 minimum, I try to get at least 70 if I can, but 65 is the minimum. And so the quick math for that is you need, we have lots of biomechanical data that says, ideally you want at least 15 millimeters of graft in each of your tunnels. So I have, if I do at a 65 and I say drill a 15 millimeter femoral tunnel and just bottom that out, okay? So now I'm left with 50 millimeters of graft. And then there's about 30 millimeters of that that goes in the joint itself. And that gives me 20 millimeters to go into my tibial tunnel. So what I'll do if I'm doing it all inside is I'll drill my femoral to 15 and I'll drill my tibial to at least about 30. It gives me a little bit of wiggle room. And then the order of fixation is I, I, I actually pull it into the tibia first. By o having over drilled that, what that does is it over pulls it into the tibia so that then it's easier to deliver up into the femur. And so I deliver it to the femur with a rigid loop uh, BTB button there. And I tension the button so that the graft is all the way in the femur. And I know I have 15 millimeters in that femur. So what that does is it guarantees my minimum on the femur. I have my 30 in the joint, and now I have that 20 plus in the tibia. And as I go to tension, by having over drilled that tibia, I'm not gonna bottom out the bone. I'm gonna be able to maximally tension the graft and um, not kind of make my graft um, loose or redundant. And that way I can do suspensory fixation on either side. So that's if I do an all inside. If I'm doing uh, a full tibial tunnel, it's the same logic on the femur. I'm gonna bottom it out. I'm gonna tension down my rigid loop BTB button. And then when I'm putting my interference screw on the tibia, the big mistake is people will put that interference screw only as far as kind of the outer cortex of the tibia. But when you have a short graft like you alluded to, 
the screw's not gonna grab enough of the graph for secure fixation. So while I'm putting that screw in, I actually stick the scope back into the knee and I look down at the tibial tunnel. And I basically just drive that screw in until I see the graft screw at the very uh, aperture of the tibia, the screw start to peek its head in. And it actually is pretty nice because I maximize my fixation on the graft that's in the tibia. So I'll get at least 20 millimeters of graft connected to that screw. But then I'll also know that my fixation is like interference aperture fit. So there's not gonna be any wiggling around of that graph within the tibial tunnel. So it's actually optimizing the fixation biomechanically as well. But you gotta stick the camera in to know you're in up, up there far enough. If it's like a nine millimeter, you said? Mm. Um, and if I'm using all inside or if I'm drilling it out, do you mean? If you've got a screw and you're doing. Oh yeah, so if I, if I got a nine millimeter graft, I drill the, drill the tibial tunnel out nine millimeters. And then I'll use a, um, a nine by 23 or a nine by 30 millimeter Milagro. And I use that technique, um, like I said, where I drilled it all the way out. So then the screw comes from, you know, lower on the distal part of the tibia, but then it goes up into where the graft is going to be fixated right at the level of the joint. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, something else I was going to ask quickly was in terms of the sizing and drafting tunnel. So you're saying that 65 is a minimum. If you do happen to get more, do you ever go above 15 in the, on the femoral side or do you always just compensate for it on the tibial side? Yeah, good, really good question. I will go up to like 20 on the femoral side if it's like a 70 to 75 millimeter graft. But to be honest, most people anatomically, if you're doing an all soft tissue graft, 70 will be like the max until you start to get into muscle. If you're going to, if they're using a bone plug, you can get up to like 80 because you're adding uh, probably 10 or 15 millimeters of bone in addition. But I have never been able even just logistically to get a graft longer than probably like 75. Definitely 70 is like a good win and 65 is at minimum. Um, you should always be able to get more than 65. It's actually it's very bizarre. People of all different sizes, it's still within like those numbers, no matter how tall or small they are. So um, it, it's, it's, it's very reproducible. But yeah, the I would go up on the femur rather than going up on the tibia to answer your question. <laughs> and if you're still not sure, then you still can fall back. You can just completely drill out the tibia and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So. And what's your diameter? I shoot for a nine. And then usually what happens is by the time you do all that stitching, it's, it either stays at a nine or even actually if the speed trap can cinch it down to like an eight and a half. Um, and then um, you can go bigger, but like I said, actually, I think I worry about too big because it's a cylindrical graft. I worry about too big being too big for, for the notch. Um, in comparison to like a patellar tendon, a patellar tendon is like a ribbon. So even though we get tens, it's 10 wide, but it's only about four to five thick. Yep. Same yep. with hamstrings, they're ribbons, right? And when you fold them over, even when you get a really good one, you maybe get like, you know, eight and a half, nine, nine and a half graft, but, but it's actually like they're ribbons that are stacked on top of each other. So, um, so I, that's why I don't do full thickness. I purposefully try to take like a cylindrical graft and I try to shoot for a nine, um, always try to be above eight and a half. And I, I try to get between, you know, that eight and a half and nine and a half range. Um, and uh, doing that seems to be, have worked pretty reliably. I just use like a, basically a free needle and pass it through the graft. The important thing is you wanna get the, the white, you know, implant stitch passed behind one of the locking stitch cause it prevents it from pulling through. And you also want to make sure the quad is layered. You want to make sure you're passing that stitch from like superficial to deep. You don't want it from like medial to lateral because it'll actually delaminate the layers. So, um, and then once you get it back on the table here, you just want the, a very minimal amount of stitch to pass through the black. And I hope it's going to show it. I didn't show it for some reason, but a minimal amount of stitch passed through. And then you wiggle through 
And with that first stitch through, you got to lock it into the card. That's tip one. And then when you go to do it with the second stitch, what tends to happen is it tends to lift the button up off the card. So you got to make sure you have a thumb pushing the button down into the card as you wiggle through so that the button doesn't pop off and then the stitch doesn't pass through. I want to make sure I understood you correctly too. So the, the it's hamstring preference and then um, there's interference fixation on the femur and then suspensory on the tibias or was it, is it vice versa? It's suspensory on both. As it pertains to the hamstring, I've done it um, all inside in that exact same way with dual rigid loops. Um, I have not drilled out the tibia for 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 an all inside ham or for sorry for a quadrupled semi-t hamstring but if i were i would do exactly as you described and just use the rigid loop xl the other question i have is does the big btb rigid loop come with an with a larger xl button or is that not available it does come with an xl button yes okay perfect so that's the perfect transition then i think for chris from australia's question is how you can transition that because if you prep, as you can see here, both sides with a BTB rigid loop, but you still want to drill out your whole tunnel, you can use the BTB rigid loop XL on the tibial side and still achieve exactly what you're doing with a quadrupled semi T, but using the quad instead. So I think, you know, for me, if I'm trying to play both sides of the fence as the surgeon or the seller and trying to transition into this, I'm going to argue for the flexibility of the sizing with the quad tendon, the adaptability to the same um, fixation devices or, or fixation concepts that you're already using, as well as wiggle room to other fixation concepts. And I think I, me personally, probably if they're doing it all the time, they got it streamlined. I think you could argue that you know, they would be basically doing the same surgery more efficiently. I would just like to thank you both and especially Dr. Anna for, for your time. And that was um, absolutely incredible. So it's really good to get those, those insights. And thank you so much for sharing all your little tips and tricks and, um, and reasons for, for why you're doing what you, what you choose to do and your choices behind that. So thank you. And thank you to Chris um, for coordinating everything. So um, yeah, I appreciate it. It's quite late at night for you guys over there. So really do appreciate your time um, on behalf of the Australian team.